Attention listeners, ahead are spoilers. Hello and welcome. This is the Movie Trap. <laughs> Thanks, I did want to try that. Hello and welcome to the Movie Trap. Uh, my name is Russell Carlson and with me as always is my good pal, Chris Boroff. Has anyone seen my cat? <laughs> and also with me, my other good pal, Zach Powers. I was going to say, where's my cat? So <laughs> here we are. You guys are peas in a pod. Uh, welcome to the Movie Trap on the Movie Trap. Uh, each of the hosts that you just met picks a theme, and then each one of us picks a movie based on that theme. Uh, once we've watched all three movies, we then vote with an allocated amount of points, plus some bonus points that we're going to earn along the way, to vote uh, which movie we like the best, or for whatever reason, or hated worse, uh, or, you know, hated less than the others. Um, so, whoever wins that vote... That host then gets to pick the next theme. So, previously on the movie trap, we are in the middle of Zach Power's uh, city theme. What that means is that we are picking movies based off of our respective current and or previous cities. Uh, Zach chose Chicago and he chose Steve McQueen's Widows. Uh, today, we are joined by, we are joined, we, we have Chris's choice of cities for Los Angeles and he has chosen 1973, The Long Goodbye. Uh, there were no bonus points given out last episode, so we're all even. Uh, we each get three bonus points that we can give out for whatever reason. Uh, but uh, if you watch the last episode, you'll know that uh, we're pretty stingy about it. So uh, everybody still got ten points for final voting and three bonus points to give out. So uh, with that in mind, Zach, shall we get into the the mi- the, the 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 gritty, grimy, uh, <laughs> convoluted? <laughs> Roughly 1973 uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> that's right. That's right. 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 <laughs> uh, sure. If uh, if you insist, we can begin the summary <laughs> of The Long Goodbye. Uh, okay. Uh, the Long Goodbye is a 1973 uh, noir film. Um, it's directed by Robert Altman. Um, it's based on uh, the Raymond Chandler novel. Um, you know, so this is a Philip Marlowe story. Um, and it stars Elliot Gould, uh, and, uh, primarily Elliot Gould. There's a couple other people, uh, but he, he really is the, the central focus of the thing. He's in basically every scene. Um, so, uh, the long goodbye, uh, takes place in a world where there is one song and only covers of that song available. (laughs) That is all, that is all the music that exists in the world. That's just some background, some world building. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and uh, it follows Philip Marlowe, as mentioned, um, who uh, one day discovers he is out of cat food. And so Philip Marlowe goes to the store and he buys some cat food and then he brings the cat food home and the cat doesn't like the cat food and leaves. And along the way, he meets his neighbors who are a bunch of young, beautiful women and then we're 15 minutes into the film. <laughs> um, at which point the plot begins. It, it seems like uh, we're being remiss not to mention that while they're also young, beautiful women, they are cavorting semi-clad and mostly naked uh, across the way. Often naked, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it they should be noted that Marlo, Marlo is more or less aloof to them. He, he yes. more or less just like passes, the, you know, they're, they're more or less just there. Yeah. He, uh, Marlo constantly is kind of mumbling to himself. He always has a cigarette in his mouth. Um, yeah, and he's just, he kind of just wants to sit at home and feed his cat, I guess. Um, anyway, his friend, Terry Lennox, comes over later in the night with the incident with the cat. And uh, uh, asks him if uh, he could give him a lift from his home in Los Angeles to uh, down to Mexico. Uh, having apparently been in some kind of fight with his wife, um, but the remaining details being somewhat unclear. Um, Marlo uh, does so. He takes Lennox down to Mexico and drops him off. But uh, shortly thereafter, the following day, two police officers accost Marlo and note that uh, Lennox's wife has been murdered uh, and take him down to the station, believing he has information on Lennox, who they 
figure is the culprit in the crime. Um, after a, a little time in police custody and some weird interrogation that involves throwing around some homophobic slurs and some blackface jokes, which is a little strange, um, yeah. they uh, let him go uh, because Lennox has committed suicide in Mexico. Um, so the police consider the case closed, but Marlo uh, is not accepting of these facts. He thinks Lennox didn't kill his wife and that Lennox himself was probably murdered in turn. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, Marlo is hired by a woman named Eileen Wade uh, in an effort to find her alcoholic husband who occasionally just sort of drifts away and winds up either in another town or sometimes in a rehab clinic. Um, and, uh, she wants Marlo to find him and bring him back home. Uh, Marlo goes ahead and, uh, investigates around rehab clinics in the area and eventually finds him kind of squirreled away in the back of this one detox clinic, um, with, uh, a doctor who is insisting he stay there for a certain amount of time and pay him $5,000 for the treatment. Um, but Marlo intervenes and uh, Wade is like, fuck this. I'm going home and I'm not paying you for this treatment. And so he goes back, seemingly case closed um, in that regard. But the Lennox, uh, the Wades also live in the same neighborhood as the Lennoxes, uh, a neighborhood with a gate guard who loves doing impressions of various celebrities. Um, and he asks them if they knew the Lennoxes at all. Um, and it seems like they're say they claim that they only knew him a little bit. They weren't super close, um, tragic about what happened to them, yada, yada, yada. But, uh, when he gets back home, Marlo finds, uh, that there is a man named Marty Augustine waiting for him, who is also connected him with Lennox. Uh, Marty is a gangster. And, uh, he had lent Lennox, uh, something like $350,000, to smuggle over to Mexico. Um, but the money disappeared and Marty figures he's going to take it out of Marlo. Um, in order to prove that he's, uh, serious, he, uh, attacks his own, uh, mistress with a Coke bottle and scars her face. Um, and is like, this is what I do to somebody I love. Imagine what I'll do to you. Um, sort of just to, drive the point home that he's in some deep shit with this guy. So um, now much deeper into this than before, Marlo makes a trip to Mexico where he, you know, sort of corroborates the details of Lennox's death. He sees some coroner's photos, uh, et cetera, et cetera, before uh, returning back to the Wade house. Oh, I should note, he also saw Marty after he left his house, went over and visited Eileen Wade for an unknown reason. So now he suspects that whatever this whole affair is, Eileen Wade is more involved than she previously uh, previously let on. Um, after returning to Los Angeles from Mexico, he goes to a party uh, at the Wade house, but uh, the doctor from the rehab clinic shows up, demands his money, and manages to uh, get it away from uh, from what's his first name, Mister Wade, Roger, uh, Roger Wade, yeah, yeah. Um, and the party sort of breaks up, but, uh, uh, the Roger and Philip continue to have drinks and discuss sort of the, um, the affairs of the Lennoxes and indeed the, the fact that Marty seems to also owe Roger a great deal of money, which is a, an interesting little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of a twist, um, but that night, Marlo decides to confront Eileen about what she knows, uh, because clearly she has some connection to Marty. But in the middle of their conversation, uh, a drunken Roger wanders into the sea and drowns, after which uh, Eileen says that she believes that Roger may have been the one who killed Sylvia. Uh, possibly the two were having an affair. Um, but the police immediately disregard this because Roger was assumedly in his rehab clinic at the time of the murder. Uh, so it seems like he has a pretty good alibi for, for that particular um, night. Uh, he uh, 
He is then he then goes to visit Marty Augustine to get more information, but uh, Augustine is still quite miffed with him and wants his money back. Uh, he begins to force Marlo uh, to strip down along with himself and all of his lackeys, <laughs> which includes a young Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, <laughs> Has no lines. No lines. Inspired yes. choice. And, One of his and, first. And the noticeable uh, creep stash. He's got like a little blonde yeah, creep yeah. stash. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is this is a good 11 years prior to the first Terminator um, yeah. so we're around pumping iron age for, for mm-hmm. Arnold. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, but after Hercules in New York, this is post Hercules in New York. Um, anyways, uh, uh, which I believe all of his lines were dubbed in Her- Hercules in New York anyway. So, uh, Absolutely. anyway, uh, Marty is going to apparently castrate Marlo. It seems to be the, the plan. Uh, in retribution for not having his money. But at the last minute, uh, mysteriously, a bag containing all of Marty's money shows up and uh, Marlo is off the hook. Uh, it seems like uh, everything has been put right and Augustine lets him go. But as he is leaving, he sees Eileen driving away from Marty's apartment. Clearly, she was probably the one who dropped off the money. So he begins to chase after her, but... Uh, is hit by a car and ends up in the hospital uh, where he is given a harmonica by a man in a full body cast. Uh, (laughs) And then he, uh, he goes back and uh, visits the Wade house to get some information from Eileen, but it seems they have left the house. Everybody's gone. It's being packed up. It seems like it's been sold. Um, And he returns to Mexico. He reconnects with the two police officers. He's discussed. uh, He talked to earlier um, having mysteriously been gifted a, uh, $5,000 $5,000 bill that seemingly came from Mr. Lennox in a suicide note. He passes that on to these two cops who give him the real truth, uh, which is that they staged the suicide. They staged the photos. They buried a bunch of bricks and Lennox is uh, alive and well, and they give him his location. Um, so Marlo tracks him down to this little villa in Mexico And uh, it's revealed that he, in fact, was the one having an affair with Eileen. And the two of them were in love. Um, So they had to get sort of the spouses out of the picture. So uh, he has this idea. I'll steal this money from Marty. Take Eileen. We could start a new life together. He had an argument with his wife uh, the night he was supposed to leave and bashed her face in in and killed her. Um, and then left Marlo to kind of play the fall guy when he ran away to Mexico to sort of distract Marty and, and the others and such. Um, Marlo, uh, not super thrilled to learn that his friend used him and killed his wife, uh, shoots him and kills him. Uh, and as he is walking away, he passes Eileen, who is on her way to the villa, and begins to play his harmonica as he leaves. And that is the story of the long goodbye. It was not okay with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I enjoyed this one. Um, it's funny, like, since we had to pick out movies that were for uh, our cities, uh, I already talked to the guys about this, but it's the common one that everybody suggests all the time is Chinatown. Mm. And I've seen Chinatown a lot, but it's also a very troubled film because of the director. Um, also, much like Crash, it gets over-suggested to people. It's to the point that I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder with it now. But this one I had a lot of fun with because it only involves movies in the opening montage. Or like the opening sequence. They play the little like, Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. That's the only time. And then at the very and the, end. And, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. And outside of that... Yeah, outside of that, it's the guy with the bad um, impressions, and nothing else has to do with making movies or being in movie making, which is a lot truer to my experience in L.A. than all the things you think are going to happen when you come to L.A. So, the, yeah. What I love about that, though, Borif, I'm going to give you a point, because I'm because uh, <laughs> that, that is totally true, is that while movie making and Hollywood tropes are not necessarily in the movie 
this movie is very aware of these tropes and are pushing hard on them. That's why I think it's it's brilliant to bookend it with the Hooray for Hollywood because it it lets you know that this movie is a fantasy. You know, this is not. You know, I, I, I think Altman even said about that is that like it's not. That that's we're not talking about Hollywood. We're talking about the fantasy. You, the audience. You're you're Hollywood. You're the. It's living in your head. That's what Marlowe mm-hmm. is to you. Um, you know, so it it it's it's a brilliant take, and it's I and I I I think what I love about this movie is I think I would have probably hated it if I saw this when I was in film school because <laughs> you know not realizing that like the self awareness in movies is sort of what I like in a lot of movies. I'm thinking of specifically the Coen brothers and probably some Tarantino zone in there too. Um, so it, it, I, I, I loved it for that reason. So, and also the fact that you bring up Chinatown, I think this movie is almost like the anti Chinatown, you know, rather than cause Chinatown takes place in a different era, you know, with the, with long goodbye, he's bringing Marlo, they're bringing Marlo into the seventies or into contemporary times when this movie's made um you know they're 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 not they're making him a fish out of water already um yeah so like I, that, that goes with his car the, too sure yeah sure and it, it goes with the way he talks and he's the only one who smokes you know like he like he's he's just a, a fish out of water really he's a he doesn't belong there um and 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 the way elliot gould sort of plays it you know it sort of draws attention to that quite a bit so yeah, you're getting a point from me for the Chinatown reference, big guy. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, so I've never seen uh, or read a uh, property featuring the character of Philip Marlowe before. Um, and assuming uh, this is a somewhat consistent characterization between different the books and other films, he is an interesting uh, sort of uh, dichotomy between other detectives of the era like sam spade who we were talking about just before we recorded in that uh like sam spade is that very hard-boiled like a dame walked in and you know blah blah and philip marlowe seems more like the kind of guy who gets he's very very chill he gets dragged into these things almost coincidentally and it does seem because when i thought of la movies one of the first ones i thought of was the big lebowski and now it seems to me that that is a philip marlowe story yeah, or yeah a Raymond Absolutely. Chandler certainly, certainly a yeah. Raymond Chandler. Like I, yeah. I think that the Coen Brothers probably borrow a lot from Raymond Chandler in many of their movies. But I mean, this movie and The Big Lebowski, you could draw a straight line. Like yeah, Zach, it, Zach gets a point from me for that because that was the same thing I was thinking of the whole time. Like it was, uh, I would say that like this one and The Big Lebowski should sort of be um, like paired. Because the weird thing is, is it's like uh, Elliot Gould is probably how the dude saw himself, but the reality of the situation was probably more the dude wandering around in a bathrobe a little <laughs> too high. The It was probably not cigarettes all the time. It was mostly weed. Um, but it's also just funny because the character, like in, um, in this movie, I really enjoyed a lot of the stuff that's sort of low-key LA stuff, like having weird neighbors with like, bullshit jobs where it's like the ladies are like candle makers and you're like how do you afford a whole apartment as a candle maker and like um what the hell is yoga (laughs) yeah or uh people who always have their cats out and about though to be honest considering where he lives i think it's way less likely that the cat ran away and way more likely that the cat ran into a coyote because that is a very common thing in the hills there um, yeah, could have joined a gang of yeah. stray cats like Aristocats yeah. or something, you know. And Join and a music band, and the weird Echo Park um, yeah. apartments, the weird mm-hmm. like almost favela like right growth that's, that's on what, every hill. Uh, for, yeah. like, that's why I'm glad because this movie does kind of encapsulate what I remember about living in L.A. You know, like, because you remember my apartment in Echo Park. It was like that. You're sort of mm-hmm. like on to, So it gives you this illusion of privacy, right? Even, But it, you don't have any privacy because you're right on top of each other. You know, but you do feel like, okay, well, at least this is my own little private, you know, whatever. Um, and it is in a way, but everybody's got one. So, you know, it, it's sort of this hill-like nature of, of Los Angeles. This it, it, it plays into that topography. And plus, you know, how... 
it, you know, it, I, it, it carries that. Plus the, the way that, uh, cause apparently they did like some sort of film processing in the post-production process of this, where they, they kind of over, um, over processed it, where it kind of makes the blacks a little lighter and all the colors kind of like, a yeah, it looked kind of milky to them. Yeah. Right. There's that, that was on, they wanted to do that on purpose, but I don't know why, but for some reason I, that's how I remember Los Angeles is I feel like there's that tone around you all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's the it's a constant like um, you know, you wind up with like just sand in the air cuz we live in a desert and then right. add to that like uh occasionally you'll get a uh, fog from the ocean. Um yep. or smog. People will say smog, but you really don't have as much Not smog really in LA that, as you I used mean, to. That, the, people who say that only reference their pictures from like the 90s and shit. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's not as bad as anyway, but but also but uh, it, it's also just like the whole vibe of everybody mm-hmm. right you know like yeah. everybody is kind of more or less self-serving um you know it and and even your neighbors you're you know it's not like there's this contentious war where i feel like that was new york you know where it's just like it's like who the fuck is that guy and this mm-hmm. one you're like you know it's okay with me you know um it it's that whole kind of vibe of of la too and i think a lot of that is chandler some of that i think is chandler because i think chandler um was wholeheartedly like a cynic um you know because keep in mind he only became a writer later in life after he lost his oil executive job because of the depression um wow so like he 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 saw the world a little differently saw hollywood very differently and and like kind of this this notion of this because part of when i remember when i first moved to los angeles the first month i lived there i felt like i was still on vacation just because everything's nice and warm and you know you just sort of just kind of get with that whole vibe of it and Mm -hmm. and chandler and marlo is sort of like that they're the the actual world i don't know it's weird yeah i like um i also like the villain as sort of a good example of i think what you were just talking about because he's an awful person but um you're talking about lennox yeah yeah well no they uh the 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 gangsters who i'm talking about sorry oh marty augustine Um, yeah good i'm glad you brought him up because i'm because he's like so sort of easygoing in his presentation, but then he's so psychotic and violent. Um, mm-hmm. I would say that is also something that like plays into a lot of how people sometimes act in LA, at least in like the film industry, where you'll wind mm-hmm. up with people that are nice, but it's all sort of a surface interaction. You don't get much deeper than that. And if you do get deeper than that, sometimes it's very awkward and uncomfortable. But uh, I've just kind of noticed that thing where there's like that presentation where everybody has sort of a chill vibe regardless of what's going on. But it's also, like you said, kind of self-serving. So it's it's an odd sort of like... Um, Dichotomy. And, and yeah, Marty like, Augustine's it, a good... Yeah, Marty Augustine's a great case point for that too because like Mark Riddell, the character who played him, like read the character and said like, this character is kind of boring um, and sort of changed him up to be more of like this kind of Jewish sort of like hard ass but like still like views himself as a family man and i'm going to temple can you believe you're making me miss out on temple tonight marlo you piece of shit Mm -hmm. um let me smash a coke bottle on my girlfriend's face you know like just to prove that like so like that's that's the the interesting part about that that apparently that was all mark riddell the the actor who played him to kind of add that color to him and it it made for a terrifying character i mean it really did because it gave you the idea that yeah this guy really thinks he's doing like he's okay, but that's what makes him more dangerous because he's capable of anything. He's he's mm-hmm. absolutely capable of anything. Um, so I think that that's that 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 was well done by Mark Riddell, who's mainly a director. Yeah. Like he directed like on Golden Pond and the Cowboys and shit. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know that he wasn't just an actor. Yeah, it uh it works for the character because he can move in sort of any crowd he wants to, but you know that he's intensely dangerous. Um, yeah. 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 But and, that's why uh, it's, talking- it's interesting that you guys have never that uh, we talked about on air to compare Elliot Gould's Marlowe to like kind of the bogey stereotype of what we think of Marlowe because like I mean Altman even is quoted saying I don't give a shit if Raymond Chandler fans hate this movie he did not care um, because it, he made Marlowe more of a kind of a loser more or less I mean like if you guys ever see The Big Sleep like it's and it's written but Lee Brackett who wrote the screenplay for this movie wrote The Big Sleep as well so like she knows Chandler really really well um and 
she's it was it was her and Altman who kind of pitched this idea of updating Chandler to bring it to the 70s and kind of Altman wanted to make him like a loser, kind of like very much like he's he's on the the bad end of the stick all the time. Um, and that's why I think having Bogey do that, that's kind of the same thing. And, and it's typical of Chandler and it's kind of the same thing in The Big Sleep. But like, for example, in The Big Sleep, just about every female character that Marlowe comes in contact with just throws themselves at him. Um, like, absolutely. No, but, but in this one, it doesn't seem like he's more or less like, disinterested he 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 can give a shit like he he really is just like hey it's okay with me you know like it's whereas like you know in in bogey's era which again we're talking 20 years before this movie was made in 1940s or whatever um and like he's he's more like well dame you know like it's it's a lot more acceptable but i don't know you you also i mean I, I was respectful that, that Lee Brackett got another go at Chandler because with the big sleep, they had to change a lot from the original text just to get by the Hayes code um, of anything that was, you know, because you couldn't even talk about pornography or anybody even close to being nude, which is a big part of uh, the big sleep. But with the long goodbye, they took a lot of liberties with it too. I mean, and, and I think, you know, a lot of that's Gould and his sort of mannerisms, and a lot of it is Altman as well. But I think the biggest change that they make is Sterling Hayden um, and the way his character is. Because, you know, in in the books, like, I think the wife shoots him, but in, in he commits suicide. And Sterling Hayden, I, I, wanna, I wanted to get Borf to, to kind of unload on Hayden because I know you're a big fan of Sterling Hayden. <laughs> but, I mean, he was – you could tell he was having a great time doing this movie. He, he, he had a great time. <laughs> I, uh, I I loved it. It was very funny watching it because I kept thinking about other, like just that trope, the entire concept of like the drunken uh, Ernest Hemingway style writer. Um, because I also, uh, <laughs> you know, I also worked for Dan Harmon for a while and he for a while had a very similar thing. Like he's, uh, he himself is not, he's not drinking as much as he used to. So he's gotten a lot healthier, but it was a real thing for a while where it seems like that writer who's like intense and very macho and like, oh, I'm going to show you blah, blah, blah. And they talk like kind of like a pirate a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I really like that character. Yeah, ultra it, macho, it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because that's also, I think, what the latter part of Philip K. Dick's life was like. Um, hmm. I read about the writer at one point and he had like a whole group of like... Uh, you know, L.A., California people hanging out in his beach house, chatting and such. And that's why eventually he wound up making those movies that were or wrote the books that were like more drug based about um, uh, they it got turned into the movie with uh, Winona Ryder and uh, the the animated thing. Oh, Do you know what I'm talking Keanu's about? And, yeah, Keanu Keanu right. Reeves, the animated I thing. Yeah. About. Uh, Scanner Darkly. Scanner oh, Darkly. Okay. But yeah. But that was like a semi-autobiographical um, novel about Philip K. Dick. And it's just interesting to me that it was oh, sort wow. of like a thing that sort of became kind of a thing in the 70s of just like these writers that were like Bukowski types that people just sort of got really into. I loved him in this movie, though, because it was like consistently like oscillating between being really warm and friendly and like a guy you'd want to hang out with to somebody who's like screaming at his wife and you wouldn't want to be around him. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting to see how that balance sort of played out in the scenes of whether this guy's going to be in a good mood or in a bad mood but that unpredictability is something that i got very used to at different times in my life being around people who drank too much yeah and especially in a position of power when it's more or less supposed to be like a social gathering but you're there for work um yeah you know like yep. it, it, it it and so but again marlo kind of plays it cool all the time he doesn't necessarily think like he doesn't necessarily judge Roger at all he's he's more or less just trying to sure. figure out what's going on you know yeah but and actually I gotta credit my wife for this and I think this is a good an interesting you notice Marlo doesn't do a lot of detecting necessarily you know he mainly gets his ass kicked and people tell him stuff you know yeah. that's that's usually how it goes he mostly he, just shows up at places and looks through the window and <laughs> right. hopefully something interesting <laughs> is going on well it, <laughs> it it it's pretty great that like the big reveal in this movie when he's like all right tell me and she's like i think he's having an affair and it's usually the big romantic like reveal that the detective finally has the details and mm -hmm. then he tells the cops and they're like yeah no we already know this you need to like let us do our job stop bothering us with this so and i was great. like oh my god it's like such a waste of his time to have been involved in this case 
Like he doesn't he doesn't even he goes so far out of his way to find out the obvious thing that the cops tell him at the start, which is that your friend killed his wife. He goes so far out of his way trying to disprove what is obviously the case. Um Yeah. I kind of wonder like if this guy's if this particular representation might have been how people felt at the time, like people coming out of the 60s where they were, you know, really um, idealistic and hopeful that they could change the world and then finding well, out like, no, no, the world's going to keep being a mess. I would say that it's the opposite. I, w- I think that this isn't what I would call an idealistic movie. It's more of a satire or a spoof, really. Um, well, I meant for people I, who had been idealistic. Well, yeah, and that's what, I mean, like, if you think about Chandler and, and namely his previous movies in the later 40s and 50s where this these stories take place post-war, right? Well, what happens at the end of 1973? You know, like, we're starting to wind down Vietnam and shit. Like, so I wonder how a lot of those sensibilities kind of play with it. You know, because especially was, you know, like, these kind of private detective stories, I mean, they're 20 years old. It's a cliche now, you know, in the 70s. It's it's a total, you know, it's it's been done like a thousand times. So I, I think this was sort of thumbing its nose at the genre in a way, um, while still trying to follow it you know and sort of send it up in a way it's it's not really a it's a weird mix of a spoof and a send-up you know like it's it's a strange mix yeah yeah and this and big lebowski and and i think like even inherent vice like follow this kind of inherent vice post for sure. ne- like post noir formula i guess where much of the runtime is like a lot of like there's this idea, I think, in in a lot of mysteries, especially classic mysteries, that every moment, every scene, every line is important. It's a clue. You have to like keep on top of it. And this movie and those movies as well, so much of it is just utterly unimportant and it's meandering. Like it tells right up front, it's like, we're gonna spend fully twelve minutes with this guy going to get some fucking cat food. And it don't matter mm-hmm. to the plot whatsoever. The so, Wikipedia page doesn't even mention the first 12 minutes of this it's film a, it's, it's because a, it's it does has no it's relevance. A commentary on friendship. Um, and there's like scenes, know. full scenes, like the scene where he's getting drunk with Roger mm-hmm. and Roger like mentions that Marty owes him money, but it kind of sort of doesn't matter. Like mm-hmm. nothing that's revealed in that scene really matters to the plot. Like this extra wrinkle of like, okay, Lennox owes Marty, but Marty theoretically owes Roger is like utterly unimportant. It has no bearing on what occurs. Sure. I mean, yeah, if you read any like Dashiell Hammett, it's, oh, it's very economic, right? It's yeah. like this chapter does this thing and it's very, very, very economic. Um, and you're right. Inherent Vice, which is a Pinchon novel. So that's a little bit different because that guy sure. did like to, 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 you know, walk around. So we say, um, but you know, with, with Chandler, I mean, this, and Long Goodbye is his longest book, apparently. Um, I never read the actual book, but the, um, you know, Chandler, a lot of mysteries you kind of rely on, like, red herring. So you are trying to send your audience kind of through this hamster wheel of, like, you're, you're ahead of the audience, but you're trying to make them think that, oh, I, I bet I could figure it out. So that's why you throw in these, like, oh, maybe it is Marty Augustine or maybe Roger did it or or whatever. And I, that I sort of understand. But you're right, Zach, that, that this the way that like Lebowski long goodbye inherent vice sort of play with that is to spend an exorbitant amount of time, you know, talking about why don't you wash your feet or whatever. Um, you know, like, and, and you think that's going to matter. And if you're an audience member, who's going to pay attention to every single frame, you're going to be pretty pissed off because you're going to waste it a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a pretty simple little mystery. And a lot of the time is just, Philip Marlowe wandering around LA and occasionally Mexico <laughs> smoking and being like, <laughs> seeing some weird shit and being like, well, that's okay with me. That's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite shot of Mexico, uh, when he first arrives in Mexico and they're playing the mariachi version of the song. Um, and he's just kind of poking his head out of the bus, you know, like a little puppy, just kind of like, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, there, uh, like I, I, when I finally caught on when I first watched this movie that every song I've heard since Hooray for Hollywood has been a variation of the John Williams, Johnny Mercer song, The Long mm-hmm. Goodbye, I laughed my ass off. I'm like, that is brilliant. Like, I love that. 
I mean, it probably made a lot of sense um, money-wise. You only have to get that one song, and then you're covered for the rest of it. You don't have to do any rights clearances. That's um, right. That's I don't know. Right. I, well, a lot, a yeah. lot of this movie seems like it was really aware it was a movie. So a lot of the like little weird offhanded moments were there intentionally because we're expecting it to mean something because we're watching a procedural that we we think it's a procedural. Mm -hmm. um, they do that, of course, in like the Big Lebowski. Like he hears someone on the phone, he goes up, he does the scribble on the card, and the guy was just drawing a cartoon character with a big dick, and yeah, that's right. all he was drawing. <laughs> um, but like it seems like this sort of a story has lent itself uh in more modern times or at least for a while to more comedy like this was also like the movie fletch mm -hmm. from 1985 mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a while after this but i don't think fletch could have existed if this hadn't happened because i think people needed to have that introduction that this stuff could be funny in that way i'll even say i don't think chinatown would have been as successful without this movie. I mean, I sure. think, look, look, I think Chinatown's a much better script. Like, I think that it's it's a lot tighter as far as the script is concerned. But that is very much only a send up to the 1940s and 50s Hollywood movies. I mean, that's what it's trying yeah. to do. Uh, this movie's doing that, but also, like, it knows it's doing that and it's letting you know it's doing that it's not trying to, it removes the veneer completely um and in a way i sort of found that a more rewarding journey just because i i appreciated the sort of candor <laughs> that uh and and so i i immediately attached myself to marlo you know mm -hmm. where you're okay i'm i'm with marlo now it's one of those movies that like yeah the weird thing with the cat at the beginning but just go with it and and it it, it does kind of it sets up the tone and the character very well, you know, like that little exchange he has with the the grocery store clerk, and the, you know, because I think the, the important thing is that the cat wants this very specific cat brand. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, will not eat any other food. And he goes to the mm -hmm. grocery store clerk and the grocery store clerk is like, hey, I need curry brand cat food. Where Where is this? And the grocery store clerk, I don't know, man, all this shit's the fucking same. And he's like, well, I don't, <laughs> you ever had a cat? No, I, why would I need a cat for? I got a girl. Uh, look at him. <laughs> He's got a girl. I got a cat. It's okay with me. You know, like, it, it, just that that sort of, like, I that amount, I don't know why, but I was like, that is the coolest character I've ever seen in my life. Just the way Marlo is with it. He's like, all right, fine, fuck it. And then to change, he, oh, okay, cat. Oh, the cat's hungry because he wrote curry brand cat. He just changed the labels uh -huh. thinking that the cat wouldn't notice. <laughs> Yeah, there's some weird stuff in it, yeah. He also tries to feed the cat, like, um, cottage cheese and an egg at one point. And it's like, oh, no, cat isn't going to like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Doesn't he try to threaten to say, like, you know, they're killing tigers in Indonesia or something? You know, like, oh, it's, yeah, it's so weird. Know. How, uh, how um, but it's, you know. How do you guys feel about the ending? Because that's one spot that hit me as funny. Because, like, we're watching the whole movie, and there's moments of violence where it's like, you know, you have... Uh, the Coke bottle, of course, which is a super disturbing sequence. And then you have the ending where, you know, Marlo shoots mm -hmm. his former friend. Um, but those are, I think, the only two on screen examples of like violence, like real intense violence. Mm -hmm. How did that play for you guys? Because I was almost disturbed at the end when he shot him more than like it didn't feel mm -hmm. like a revenge at that point. It just felt like disturbing. Like it felt like. Yeah, you're Marlo like, had committed an actual crime. Yeah, this character in particular, it's uh, you know because he's such like we've been talking like how mellow and laid back this character is constantly. The fact that he's the only character that we actually see on screen commit a genuine like murder of any kind, or, or yeah, is it's, yeah. it's interesting. Like it's, something, yeah, yeah, Go it's ahead. abrupt too. Both both acts of violence are mm -hmm. like it, I I found both acts pretty shocking like yeah you, you're right you don't get this sort of like ah, i got him marlo you know like you you get the sense like jesus um you know like did that pretty harsh marlo um and then with the coke bottle it just happens so suddenly that you're like oh my god and yeah. i i sort of respect that and again not to we keep bringing up the cohen brothers but the cohen brothers do that shit all the time like they they will have no violence and then these very stark like almost like explosion of violence and very like jarring and you the audience member aren't so much like you're, you're horrified by it almost um yeah i i loved it i thought it was badass it's different from i mean there's other genres that 
do something similar, but diff- but in a different way. Like, I feel like a lot of uh, Westerns, and in particular spaghetti Westerns, have this thing where, like, there'll be big buildup to violence, and then the violence will happen very quickly, very abruptly, and, and be over. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that the buildup is... And Tarantino does that a lot, too. Sure. Um, but uh, I think that it's different there, because in those it telegraphs that violence is coming for a long time. Like there is this, the buildup is very tense. Uh, it's very slow. You know, sooner or later, like the bullets are going to start flying in this, in both instances, like the violence comes very much out of the blue in a way that it doesn't in those, those, those uh, spaghetti westerns or Tarantino movies. It's like yeah. a very relaxed hangout. We're all, Hey, can I just have a Coke? You know, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Terry, I figured out what happened. And then all of a sudden he turns around to get him a drink and shoots it's, him. Well, I mean, it's weird because it almost plays like, uh, like, have you ever been around dogs right before they get into a fight where they get quiet? Like in a hmm. lot of films, you have that quiet moment where it's like, ooh, it's getting tense. Everyone's very quiet. All of a sudden something's going to happen in this one. It kind of starts getting quiet, but the guy, his presentation is so easy and is so loving and he's so quiet that when it finally pops and he like hits the lady with the bottle, it's super disturbing because it literally didn't give you, like you said, there was no telegraphed moment, but it also has that sense of like leaving you a little shook for the rest of the movie because you're like, ooh, they might do that to me again without warning, Um, which... I wouldn't say that I didn't see the gun at the end coming because I right. had a feeling that yeah. he was going to shoot Climax somebody. Is coming. We're almost done with this yeah. movie, you know. Yeah, like something, something's. I was surprised happen. it wasn't on the beach because all the all the pictures I've seen is Marlo with a gun on the beach, and I yeah. expected someone on a beach to get shot, and that That's doesn't a happen. That's a lot of the a lot of what failed this movie because this movie did not do particularly well when it was released. Um, it 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 like. Siskel and Ebert apparently loved it. Pauline Keel loved it. Um, but a lot of the critics hated it. A lot of those critics have kind of done a mea culpa about it now because it's endured for so long. Um, but it was marketed at first to first be like the big sleep and, you know, like gritty mm. Marlowe, you know, not. And to and then it bombed in L.A. and then they re-released it in New York with a different marketing team to kind of play up the more mad magazine spoof of it and it did a lot a little better um but you know again it it it, i mean la also doesn't la also doesn't really have a sense of humor about itself very much like it takes itself way seriously so yeah the fact that this movie was how could you do this to bogey's marlo you know like how you know like that 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 was a lot of the outcry and i'm sort of with altman i don't give a shit like i'm 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 with altman on this i think that's a good take on the character and to bring him into contemporary times, he would be more, if you were to put Marlowe from 1950 into 1973, he would be like, well, whatever, you know, okay. Naked yeah. chicks. All right. Fuck it. Okay. I, I really okay. liked, I really liked the, uh, the impressions guy. Sorry, Zach, I'll let you go. <laughs> Just the impressions guy for me kind of made the movie because it's like a shitty impression that people are expecting you to like sit through and go, Oh, I get the impression. Um, might have been a reference to like what Elliot Gould was doing because he was putting on a little bit of a a little bit of a uh, an accent, but I think he like mm. made it personal enough. It wasn't obvious it was bogey, but mm. for my experience, like that is a lot of L.A. is like people mm-hmm. remembering movies and then doing impressions and then being like, right, right, it's movies. Anyway. Go ahead, Zach. I, I think the I think the funny part about that the, his Barbara Stanwyck is quoting Double Indemnity, which is a Chandler script. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that it's a um, couple of things. One about uh, you know the reception at the time and the way it's looked back upon. I do. Uh, I get. I think now and then I understand why a lot of people do not care for this movie. There were a couple times where I was a little bit like, okay, it needs to move along. Like the clip is a little slow for me. Um, <laughs> and like, even for a movie made in 1973, like this is very meandering. Like other movies that came out that year, like mean streets, uh, Serpico, one of the dirty, hairy sequels, live and let die. The exorcist, like movies could move along in a, like they were slower than they are now, but they moved at a clip a little more, 
speedy than this particular movie does. Um, uh, this is but very also, much an, Alt- an um, Altman thing, just kind of taking your time to do whatever. Mm-hmm. 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 The McDavid I think some of Miller. some mm-hmm. of the marketing for this movie seems very bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, like there, you're right, Chris. I saw a lot of that picture of him on the beach with a gun, and then I, there's another. Like I'm looking at some of the original posters, and there's basically two variations. One is this one with that's him holding a gun with a cigarette, like an, an uh, that's a drawn. The, yeah. And it says the quote, the log line is nothing says goodbye like a bullet. And then it's attributed to Philip Marlowe. Yeah. And then there's a little asterisk that says it's like from the book or something. Um, and then the other <laughs> one is a little, the, movie. <laughs> the other one is a little bit more, uh, the one, the other one is a little bit more accurate, I think, because it's him with a cigarette and it's got the cat on his back. And the line there is, I have two friends in the world. One is a cat. The other is a murderer. And that seems a little bit more appropriate. I, I think the funny part is, I think they actually used that cover. And when, when this movie came out, they re-released the book and that, you know, like they do today. And I think they used that post picture for the, for the re-release of the book. The funny part is that cat's not in the book. There is no cat in the book. Um, it, Philip it Marlowe also does seems not like have a, a cat. It also seems like a sizable spoiler. Uh, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just a thought. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, Chandler. I mean, Chandler was a fan of cats. He had a whole essay about it. He liked cats, um, and that's sort of where they borrowed a lot of that. Because apparently, Altman told Gould, "Like, I don't really give a shit if you read all the long goodbye. I just want you to read Chandler on Chandler, which is like a collection of his like short essays or whatever, just to get a more of a sense of his rhythm of speaking and and the way he talked. That's what he cared more about. I don't think he really cared about plotting, and neither did Lee Brackett, by the way, who." again, knew Chandler and, and worked with Chandler back in the Howard Hawks film in The Big Sleep. She was even like, this is cliche as hell. This is, you know, we, we can do better than this. Um, so I think that that meandering was sort of Altman's answer to Marlowe of like, you expect this to be like a high octane or not maybe high octane, but a little bit more of a pulse than you would expect than this movie delivers. But the fact that this movie moves at the pace that it does and allows the space for ghoul to sort of just be more or less like kind of a clownish sort of clumsy klutz. Uh, it builds more on the sort of satire spoof element, comedy element, really. They're, they're trying to, I think, make you laugh at some points uh, rather than trying to make you engaged in the mystery. But I, I, I agree with you, Zach. This movie is not for everybody. I mean, like I, 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 like I said, if I had watched this movie when I was in film school, I'm not sure if I would have liked it. I would have had probably the same response. I had, where's my, where's my bogey? Um, but now it's a lot like liking a band that you like and then knowing that that band likes other bands that you've never heard of. And you're like, well, I'm sure they're fine. And then you listen to those bands later on and you're like, oh, well, now I fucking get it. That's how this movie felt with me. This is a lot like me being a fan of Neurosis and then suddenly discovering Godflesh or or like Swans or Amoebics or something like that. Like it's that level of like, oh, okay, there's stuff that I really love was genuinely inspired by this film. Uh, so in that respect, I, I, I sort of latched onto this movie probably – uh, a lot more in my old age. Yeah. The, uh, it, it reminded, that sounds like how I got into King Crimson. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> what, one other thing about LA, this, this movie like has another LA thing that, uh, I didn't realize it was going to have in it. The rehab scam. The, uh, this uh, is a real Dr. Verringer. Yep. yep. Yeah. This is a yep. super, super common thing. Still exists. Um, this actually is what we uh, have a huge homeless crisis out here because of. Uh, mm. Essentially, in the 80s, uh, Reagan, yeah. well, partially, but uh, Reagan um, essentially said, you know, he, he privatized mental health industry. So a lot of people that would have been in um, mental health facilities were sort of given a ticket somewhere and just told to go there. And they decided California was where they were going to come. And well, after wait, should we go to this, this movie did come out a good when seven Reagan, years prior to Reagan it did. becoming president. Well, it he did. was governor of California, though. He was, yeah. I guess. But here's how that scam works now. Basically, when people get out here, uh, once uh, the Affordable Care Act started, 
people were being brought into these um, rehab facilities and then they would use up all of their insurance, all of that would get paid off, all of that would get, you know, charged, and then they would just kick them out. So you wind up with all these people who, you know, should be in a mental health care facility getting sent out here because they have a drug issue. They end up in one of these dry out clinics. The dry out clinic essentially just keeps them in there until they can use up all of their money and then kicks them out. Um, so the fact that they showed one of these clinics uh, in sort of a spoof manner, but in a fairly legitimate manner. Um, uh, it originally, I think they were, you know, it was that thing where people who were alcoholics or people who had a drug issue, who were famous and rich, they would go and stay at these colonies. Those colonies transitioned over to just sort of taking money from everybody. So it was interesting to me to see that that was something that was already percolating as a problem uh, that could be turned into a thing in the movie that it was like a, a meme almost at that point where they're like, oh, okay, well, this is obviously what the scam is in California is you're drying out, but you're just that, going back in and out of a revolving door process. And again, that, that sounds just like vintage Chandler really. Cause like, it's... again, wholehearted cynic. I mean, his, one of my favorite lines of his is the the law in Los Angeles is what you could pay for. Uh, yeah. It, and it's definitely, they, uh, I think they do a good job of, as briefly and as sort of a subplot aspect of it as that another thing that like in the big picture of this plot, that whole thing with the rehab clinic is not greatly important. Like in terms of the Lennox mystery, it doesn't really matter, but uh, it is, I do think it's, you know, it's an interesting and well portrayed subplot. Like the way this guy keeps coming for, for his money, even though he only did like part of this course, he's like, you still owe me the entire amount. And when Marlo tried to go in the front door, how the receptionist is like, that guy's not here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. just turns him away, mm-hmm. straight up lying about his whereabouts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's weird, too, because Dr. Verringer, um, played by Henry Gibson, was m- yeah. mainly known as a comedic actor at that time. Yeah. I mean, we uh, know listener, for a litany of you, things. But... You might know this guy from The Burbs. Uh, yep, yeah. He plays like the main sort of neighbor guy, Klopek, I think his name is in that movie. Yep. He uh, plays the head Nazi in the Blues Brothers. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, and that's, I, I think that was an interesting subplot. And again, that's, it, it, you throw in these kind of red herrings, basically, to, to make the audience think that it plays into the bigger picture and that it doesn't. And it's really just Chandler just wanting to take a piss out of, uh, doctors and shit and greed yeah. and what have you um so yeah i think that that's and also that's why i think that you know you know i i don't think do you think that that the the rehab bit was played for comedy borif um i think that it was played um more for uh being a red herring because okay. when you see it you I start agree. thinking I that agree. that's going on because the guy the fact is is the character is still sort of a comedic actor and it's sort of a comedic performance sure but i think marlo himself it, is sort of like a like i said kind of like mm-hmm. a dick van dyke klutz you know yeah so it does ha- it actually does have a very strange thing i'm not quite sure how i'm supposed to take that sequence either because the character is sort of threatening that character also commits the only other act of violence on screen he slaps um roger at one point mm-hmm. like give me the money roger and slaps him mm. um mm. Which is kind of a funny. That had moment, to be cause... rewarding for Henry Gibson. That had to be pretty rewarding, because <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. apparently Hayden, appara- according to Altman, Sterling Hayden was just like stoned on weed and drunk the whole time, and it showed. It showed. Yeah, I mean, I assumed that was just the character, but I suppose that makes sense. <laughs> I, I I like Sterling Hayden. He was great in this. Um, My, I can yeah. see why he was yeah. a big star. Uh, yeah. Uh, who also? That's. It's the same guy who played Jack D. Ripper in yep, in, yep. Yeah. in Doctor Strange Love and mm-hmm. the Big Boss in Nine to Five. Um, right. Uh, <laughs> right. So our third, our third interaction, our third Sterling, Sterling Hayden. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that he's an interesting character. So like, one thing about this movie is most of the characters, in one way or another, are lying to Marlowe. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, like Eileen is, Lennox is, etc. Um, and I think that there is a thing about one aspect of LA that I think it is sort of satirizing is that even if you're not necessarily in the entertainment industry, it's about this 
creating a fake version of yourself kind of Correct. thing. And I Correct. think mm-hmm. Roger is an interesting aspect of that because he is very much trying to be like this Ernest Hemingway badass. And like the thing about Ernest Hemingway is at least it was somewhat validated for him because he did mm. some crazy wild shit. Mm-hmm. And I get the vibe that Roger has never done anything like that. Like he get this doctor comes along and slaps him and gets him to pay up his money. Like this guy folds so easily, but he has this perception yeah. is this like even the, even the guy, you know, it's the, the guy doing the impressions at the gate, everybody lying to him. Like the only people who are the, the I mean, the, the neighbors are just checked out. I'm not even sure what to, to make <laughs> of mm-hmm. that. But, um, but the only people who are like, particularly kind of just being themselves are Marlo who just kind of wanders around like, and arguably Marty Augustine, who is a full blown sociopath pretty much. I I would say the cat too. The cat is honest. It doesn't like the food. It just leaves. Wants curry brand cat food. What do you want? (laughs) Um, And, and I I do think there's like, it's saying something about, the performative aspect of living in LA, even if you're not in the ent- entertainment industry. One thousand, you know what, Zach, you're getting a fucking point because I think that 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 is why this is one of those quintessential LA movies. Not just the topography of the way it shows, but the way people are. You know, it's all a facade. One of my, you know, like both. Li- I've lived on both coasts, New York and LA, and they get compared to a lot. One of my favorite comparisons I always make is people cars. Now, both coasts drive very nice cars, very very nice cars. But when you see people get out of nice cars in New York, even in Long Island and New Jersey, they still kind of look okay. In Los Angeles, they'll walk out in their pajamas out of like a Lexus and shit, you know, when they're just like, they'll, they'll go out and when they're getting their gas, they'll be in their jogging outfit. Like, they don't care. Um, so it is this kind of like, you're not supposed to care, but you do care. You know, like, it's this sort of like dichotomy and that's why Marlo's so great at it because Marlo is okay with me, you know, like, he he's sort of like, but yet he's got like a moral code, clearly, mm-hmm. right? Like, he's got yeah. like a code that he lives by. There's, Marlo is an interesting, again, the two people who are the ones who are being themselves are the two people who have on-screen violence. Like, there is some aspect of Marlo that he is clearly hiding. Because a guy yeah. as chill as Marlo would not just pull out a gun and shoot his friend in the back because of this whole, like, there is something in Marlo that is like this curled up, like, bit of anger or resentment or something. Well, I kind of wonder if pushed way down. I kind of wonder if Marlo might be lying to himself a little bit. Because they, they have one, hmm. they have like a throwaway shot in the movie of a Leonard Cohen album cover. And... Yeah. The thing is, is that he's dressed like Leonard Cohen for most of the movie, and Leonard Cohen, hmm. like, has a presentation about him that I would say is pretty close to what Glenn Gould was doing here, as far as, like, the, the, the famous... Elliot Gould. Elliot Gould? Elliot Gould, yeah. The, the famous, uh, famous yellow raincoat that's sort of, like, the other man, uh, the, the, the tragic third blue. man in a love triangle. Yeah, yeah. Blue raincoat. Famous blue raincoat? Okay, I've got a lot of my Leonard Cohen stuff screwed up, I guess. But anyway, also I almost, Leonard Cohen is dead. He's not so it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I was just kind of wondering if that might have been something in the back of their minds when they were creating this character and sort of its presentation and how it was appearing on screen. Mm. I I think they must have because it, it that that ties in with the plot. I mean, he is lying to himself. He's saying, "No, yeah. Terry couldn't have done this. Terry couldn't have done this." So he is lying to himself throughout the whole movie until he can't anymore. Um, so I think that that plays into to the plot quite well. Um, so that's the, that I, I there's a lot to unpack in this movie. That's why I could understand why it's endured for so long. I mean, it, it's it, 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 I it, because how rare is it? I, I guess we can move on to probably final thoughts here. Um, because, like, I adore this movie, but, again, I'm glad I saw it when I older, and I certainly understand why this would turn off a lot of people, because when you spend a lot of time, like, I know, like, my little brother, if you're listening, don't watch this. You're not going to like it. Um, <laughs> like, he, I am charmed by Elliot Gould's sort of antics and his interactions with the world around him. If you're not charmed by that, I can see how this movie would be very, very boring. Um you know, and and again, Big Lebowski is one of my favorite movies. So the fact that this movie and 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 Big Lebowski go almost hand in hand, like I think that like you, this is almost like a 
a Coen Brother 101 in in the way that they handle mysteries and stuff. Um, plus, I mean, enough can't be said about Raymond Chandler. I think Raymond Chandler, you know, like one of his one of the best Billy Wilder movies and scripts is Double Indemnity, and that was and it's not even a Chandler book; it's a one of his contemporaries, uh, James Cain. Um, that script, wa- airtight, great script in Double Indemnity, um, and to see. Chandler be interpreted again by Lee Brackett, but then through this prism of Altman, where again, we, we brought this up last episode. I'm not a huge Altman fan. Like I, and maybe that was because of film school where everybody was just pushing Altman on me all the time. And I sort of like kind of resisted it. Um, so, I, and his, the, the, the style of the whole talking over everybody all the time as to make that sort of realism is fine, but it also could be very distracting and turn you off for some reason. And I, I almost don't know why this movie plays that note very well, because it walks that line of, is this, if you just take this movie as a straight mystery, you're going to miss the satiric and almost like sense of humor that this movie and the metatextual stuff that this movie is very much throwing at you. If you only take it as a spoof or a satire, you're going to miss a lot of like the very human commentary and, and, and critiques on human interactions that this movie is trying to hint at, especially with the notion of, of friendship and honesty between friendship. So I think if you try to just take one or the other. You have to take them as both. So that's what makes this movie, I think, uh, unique. And you could really never do a movie like this. Like, it just doesn't work most of the time. Doesn't work. Um, you know, like, even, like, Brick, Rain Wilson's movie, I felt was sort of kind of trying to do something similar, like having a, a Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler sort of story, but in this sort of high school sort of element you know where there's still this impending but there's still like this sort of machismo about the main character there's still this kind of like brash toughness there's no sense of that with Elliot Gould's Marlo there's no sense of that like I'm in danger when Marlo enters the room quite the opposite you feel almost calm when Marlo enters everything kind of chills out when Marlo enters this room Elliot Gould's Marlo so bold and uh unique so in that respect uh I adore this movie so thanks for picking it Borif uh I will go next. Uh, we'll let, uh, as per usual, the person who picked the movie have the last word. Um, uh, yeah, so this uh, was interesting. I'm actually going to retroactively give uh, Russell a point for something he pointed Ooh. out earlier, which was uh, the way that he wrote the brand of the cat food on the can and then gave it to the cat and the cat left. And I actually, thinking about that, like actually uh, stuck with me a little bit because I think that there is an interesting parallel. To, like we've been talking about the performative aspects to LA and like the false face that you put forward. And I think that the reaction of the cat to this, like this lie, this like <laughs> fake cat food is in many ways, like how uh, Marlo himself reacts to Lennox when he finds out Lennox. Interesting. It's like he wants Lennox mm-hmm. to be telling the truth for the whole movie. And when he finds out that this guy he thought was his friend was like the last real dude in, in LA lied to him. He's like, fuck you it's done and i think the cat responds to a similar way at the beginning with the fake cat food interesting like, you know you could give me shitty food but don't fucking lie to me i, th- um, I think the, the cat also is a good example of how the audience reacted to the movie <laughs> yeah probably so and i'm that's the other thing like i like uh, there are elements of this movie i like i like i think there are very underplayed things that it's saying about la which is not a place that i've lived i've only visited for you know a week here or there um and I think that it has some like interesting stuff that is later iterated upon by people like the Coens or Paul Thomas Anderson. And I will admit that I, I probably slightly prefer those movies to this one at the end of the day. If I had to rewatch one, it'd be, you know, it'd probably be over in that camp. And I can't pretend I didn't occasionally struggle with the meandering uh <laughs> tone of this movie like it was hard not to occasionally look at the phone when there were long slow sequences we're not boy here it comes the long goodbye yeah the six (laughs) different colors of the long goodbye um so there were things i enjoyed i don't i can't i can't i I, I agree with russell like it's not for everybody um and it i it's not a hundred it wasn't a hundred percent for me it wasn't zero percent for me like i enjoyed it Um, But there were struggles therein. But I appreciate a lot of what it did and a lot of uh, the uh, 
the DNA that this movie has that has been passed down uh, since then. So, yeah, that's where I'm at with this one. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Chris. Yeah, um, for me, I enjoyed the movie. Um, I had kind of a strange experience with this one because the first time I tried watching it, it was like sometime in 2012 and it was on Netflix. And I think I made it through the cat section <laughs> and then something came up and I left the movie. Like I couldn't finish the movie and then I couldn't get back to it because I was very guilty at the time of having that like long list of like, oh, I should watch that at some point on my Netflix, but never actually did it. Um, this one though, I think there was actually value in going back to it and watching the whole thing. Um, I really enjoyed, like I said, the fact that it was about LA, but not about movie making because movie making is such a slight part of LA. Like people talk about it constantly. It's the reason tourists come out here, but when you're actually out here living, there's, you know, a couple million people that don't have anything to do with the film industry that are the majority of the city. So only hearing about the film industry tends to be hearing about Hollywood as it likes to put itself out there, as opposed Indeed. to hearing about Hollywood in terms of like the homelessness crisis and everything else happening out here. Um, Even that nowadays is just like the policy with the homeless now is just like put them somewhere where you can't see them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If we make yeah. homelessness illegal, their problem solved. Yeah. Oh my God. It's uh yeah. So that is definitely a part of the grand scheme of LA that this movie kind of gets right. Um, I enjoyed all the odd unexpected things like the fact Arnold Schwarzenegger just appears in the background, which, you know, I mean, he's just an extra in this and he could have continued being an extra whatever, but the fact that he appears and it's like, Oh yeah, the super famous guy now, just hanging out in the background with a weird, creepy mustache. Right. Yeah, right. Um, Ordered to strip by his yeah, right. <laughs> little gangster boss. Right, right. That, yeah, that right. stuff, too. I really enjoyed the weird, absurdist flourishes. Like, everything mm -hmm. involving this terrifying nightmare gang that then just starts stripping. Mm -hmm. Where they're like, all right, take all your clothes off. And he's like, I don't want to take all my clothes off. He's like, all right, no, well, I'll do it. And it's like, how how is that the go-to for a crime syndicate is that we will all get naked to make the guy that we're going to torture and potentially castrate feel more emotionally centered in having to be naked in a group, which also I like that Marlon very... barely gets his jacket off, but the rest of the yeah. crew is already down to their skivvies, you know? Well, like... that's, that's also a very LA thing. Like yeah, right. people are really worried about, Oh, how does it, how does it impact you emotionally? It's like, <laughs> Well, there's a difference between emotional impact and being castrated. I think castrated's far more intense than feeling slightly uncomfortable about right. being in my You're going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be in pain, so I'm going to take yeah. my time. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. That's so silly. The, 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 the absurdist nature, that's why I, I, I not to keep on, because, like, again, this movie is not about Hollywood, but it's very much aware that it's a it's about, I mean, because, again, like, he almost hits a dog, right, and calls the dog Asher. Well, that's Nick and Nora Charles's dog. There's a deleted scene. There was a, apparently a deleted scene that didn't make it and still isn't there where Marlo gets into, Elliot Gould's Marlo gets into an elevator, and he's standing next to Steve McQueen, who Steve McQueen is supposed to be Sam Spade. So, like, <laughs> this is... It's what it's what the Coen brothers, I agree with Zach that they do much better. It's making fun of this genre, but it loves this genre. It it is very much done it with tender love and care while still like thumbing its nose at it. I wish they had kept that McQueen stuff because I do think that uh the last movie we watched, Widows, was a bit of a slow burn where a lot happened near the end. Mm -hmm. Um this one follows that format and the McQueen connection would have been another uh, <laughs> I know. <right>? <laughs> <laughs> It is funny that there are now two two famous Steve See, McQueens. Famous so Steve you McQueens, have to like I know, asterisk right? every time you say it. Could not could not be more different. Yep. <laughs> like yep. literally could not be more different people. <laughs> well, all right. Well, that was fun. It was it was fun for me. So now uh before I get onto my um New York, New York. Uh, let's get a rundown of the points because we actually did uh we did well. Like we do with our second round, we sort of overcompensate from our lack of uh of giving in the first round. So, uh, Borif, you now have 11 points with two bonus points. You got a bonus point for me for the Chinatown reference. Uh, I have 11 points. I got a point for Zach about the cat food uh, with one more uh, bonus point to give out. And Zach, you now have 12 points because you got a bonus point from Chris about Big Lebowski and you got a bonus point 
from me, uh, and I forgot why. But anyway, that is where we stand. So 12, 11, 11 with uh, bonus points to come out. So now the suspense is over. Round three comes to me, and I'm not going to lie, guys. I had a hard time. I've been racking my brain trying to pick because not only is it New York City and arguably the most filmed city in the United States. Um, it's either that or LA. Yeah, right. Um, so I, there's a lot of ways I could go with this. First of all, it should be said, I haven't lived in New York in over 10 years. Um, so I didn't want to do something that made me feel too much like a fraud or a phony. Um, so I wanted to try to pick something that was like a personal connection to me. Um, you know, so I, I thought a lot about when I was around. So I thought about like the black swan had just come out and that takes place in New York. And that kind of mirrors the kind of like getting into the entertainment industry kind of thing. Um, and then I thought about, well, I, you know, and then I thought about, well, why don't I do a classic, you know, New York. So I thought about, well, what, what do I know about New York in the seventies? So I can't really do anything gritty like Serpico or taxi driver or anything like that. Uh, but I could do something that I have like a personal relationship to like the odd couple of the apartment. Um, but then you guys chose movies that you hadn't seen before. So I thought I would go in that spirit. Um, so it's a movie I had not seen before and it takes place in Harlem. I'm going to choose If Beale Street Could Talk. I believe it came out in 18 or 17. I have yet to see it. Um, it's a James Baldwin uh, novel, I believe. So I have been very curious to saw it. I know Regina King won the Oscar for it. And uh, yeah, I've been meaning to see it. So since you guys picked movies you haven't seen before, I thought I would uh, respond in kind. Uh, so If Beale Street Could Talk. Uh, I have seen this movie. So oh, okay. um, yeah, I we haven't seen it yet. Visit. I'd be interested to watch it. I love James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. I've always found him to be a very interesting character. Yeah. Um, and I think the director, I, I can't remember the director's name offhand. but it's Barry I, Jenkins. Barry, Barry Jenkins. Jenkins, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Moonlight. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think that that's, you know, a lot of quality in there. So, I mean, you know, can't say that hasn't steered me wrong before, but let's give it a go. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that was fun, everybody. And uh, do tune in next time uh, for our final round where we will do final voting and pick the next theme that we will uh, succumb ourselves to. So uh, on that note, uh, it's okay with me. Uh, I've been Russell Carlson, and I have been joined by Chris Boreff. It's okay with me. <laughs> and I've also been joined by Zach Bowers. You have a Coke? <laughs> it's a little <laughs> flat. <laughs> I like that it's just an unopened Coke in the ice pot. It's an open no, Coke it's in a, an it's ice pot. It's a fully open Coke that has one sip Like left sip in it. it. Uh -huh. I mean, how long has that thing been in there? It's so great. The guy lives like a college student. It's great. All righty. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for joining us in the movie trap. Uh, we'll see you all next time. And remember, Diane Ladd is too young to play Chevy Chase's mom. Movie trap problem. It's true. See you guys. Milo, just answer the question. You want to know what I did last night? Mm -hmm. Well, my cat woke me up in the middle of the night. He was really hungry. So I went into fixing his favorite kind of cat food, curry brand. You know, it's the only kind he eats. And I was out of it. So I fixed something else up, and the cat clawed the hell out of me. Just wouldn't touch it. So I, I went out to the uh, Thrifty Mart. You know, it's open 24 hours to get some curry brand cat food. And they were out of curry brand cat food. Son of a bitch. So I got a couple other cans, you know, and I came back and I switched the labels and the cans around and the son of a bitch cat just left. He Marlo, will you forget the goddamn cat?